Okay. So I apologize, I forgot to hit record, um, but I'll just start in this second slide here. So in the early hours of December 7th, 1941, the men and women living and serving in Pearl Harbor were not prepared for the aerial assault that ensued over a two hour period that morning. The casualties of the day that will live in infamy included 2,403 dead and 1,178 wounded Americans, including both civilian and military losses. Hundreds of wounded and dying soldiers were rushed to first aid posts and military and medical facilities, all of which were understaffed, undersupplied, and largely unprepared for an attack of this magnitude. Nurses who were not trained in, emer trained in emergency or trauma care were expected to quickly triage and care for hundreds of patients, perform tasks beyond their normal duties or expertise, and work unending hours to tend to those injured in the attack. A lot of people have written about the attack on Pearl Harbor, but the nursing and medical activities are often absent or overshadowed by the military activities. Nurses from the Navy and Army arrived on the island of Oahu, Hawaii throughout 1941 in anticipation of threats in the Pacific. As the war in Europe intensified, an increased number of young women became part of the Army and Navy Nurse Corps. However, numbers were not yet high enough to meet the potential need should the United States become involved in a war in the Pacific. After World, War II, after World War I, the number of nurses in the military dropped dramatically and continued to drop during the Depression era. When Germany declared war on Poland in 1939, the US began to mobilize resources to both aid the allied troops in Europe and prepare in case the US was forced to enter the war as well. This included an aggressive recruiting campaign to entice young unmarried nurses to enter the military. Many men and women joined the armed forces out of a sense of duty or patriotism towards their country. However, this was not always the case for the nurses. For many nurses, the military offered opportunities to do something different, see the world and seek adventure in far off places like Hawaii or the Philippines. When the nurses were off duty, they could be found visiting Oahu's many beaches, attending formal balls at the officer's club, or going out on a date with one of many single men. Army nurses were given relative rank, which meant that they were considered officers and were given titles, but had no actual authority to command outside of the Army Nurse Corps. Nurses entered as second lieutenants, chief nurses were considered lieutenants or captains, and the superintendent of the Army Nurse Corps was a major. In the Navy, nurses were socially considered officers. They could go to the officers club and socialize with other officers, but they had no rank or authority. The nursing staff of the Army and Navy was supplemented by enlisted corpsmen who performed many of the daily nursing tasks under the training and supervision of the ward nurse. The nurses had no additional training provided by the military. Most of the nurses had no idea how to manage a large influx of casualties, how to assess and prioritize the care of trauma patients or the types of casualties seen in war zones. Only those seasoned veterans had ever seen any war casualties. Some nurses had never even heard of shrapnel and any knowledge relevant to the care of patients during a war would have been learned during their experience as a civilian nurse or a student. As fighting intensified in Europe, the US also launched an aggressive campaign to cripple the Japanese advances throughout Asia by stopping oil exports to Japan. Japan knew they could not sustain their war operations without resources from the United States and reasoned the only way to beat the US would be to quickly and efficiently attack and dismantle the American military forces in the Pacific. Although the US military suspected a Japanese attack was a possibility, they thought the Philippines would be a more likely target. With all of the air and sea defenses at Pearl Harbor, it was thought to be an impenetrable fortress and most assumed the Japanese would never dare to attack it, including the nurses. By December 1941, there were close to 150 army nurses stationed in Hawaii serving at three army medical facilities, Tripler General Hospital, Schofield Hospital and Hickam Field Hospital. The Navy also had nurses at their two hospital facilities, the Naval Hospital Pearl Harbor with around 29 nurses and the USS Solis, a hospital ship floating alongside the battleships in Pearl Harbor with 13 nurses aboard. The hospitals are mapped here. Schofield Hospital is in Northern Oahu and served the Army base at Wheeler Field, 
Tripler General Hospital was located near Honolulu and was the primary army hospital for the Pacific. It was located at Fort Shafter. Naval Hospital Pearl Harbor, Hickam Field Hospital, and the hospital ship USS Solace were all located in the immediate vicinity of Pearl Harbor. The Solace was anchored just off Battleship Row in the harbor. The Naval Hospital was located at Hospital Point near the entrance to Pearl Harbor, and Hickam Hospital was just inland off the Navy base of, at Hickam Field. Hickam Field was the primary Army air base for Oahu at the time. At 0600, the morning of December 7th, 1941, six Japanese carriers stationed 200 miles north of the island of Oahu launched the first wave of planes set to destroy Pearl Harbor. At approximately 7.55 a.m., the Japanese arrived flying low over Pearl Harbor and began dropping armor-piercing bombs, shallow water torpedoes, and a hail of bullets on the island of Oahu. This well executed well-executed surprise attack by the Japanese caught the United States completely off guard and unprepared. During and immediately following the two waves of the Japanese aerial attack, hundreds of wounded and dying soldiers were rushed to several medical facilities, including hospitals, first aid stations, and aboard ship sick base. The patients were quickly transferred to military hospitals on or near the Naval and Army bases. Hickam Hospital was only a 30 bed hospital with two nurses on duty at one time and only six total nurses assigned to the hospital. Nurse Monica Conter, already on duty at the hospital, ran out on the porch overlooking the airfield and could see the rising sun on the planes attacking the base. She quickly began to evacuate all the patients on the third floor wards to the first floor where she believed that they would be safer. While moving patients in the elevator, the electricity went out. All of the clocks stopped at 7.55 a.m. Army nurses Kathleen Coberly and Sally Eintrichen were in their quarters when the bombing began. They looked out the window facing Pearl Harbor and could see the planes with the rising suns on the sides surrounded in clouds of smoke. The phone rang in the quarters and Kathleen Coberly's date had called to cancel. He told her, quote, honey, we're at war. The Japanese are bombing the hell out of us. The nurses, frightened and numb from the shock of what they could see from their bedroom window, quickly threw on their uniforms. An army officer arrived to escort them safely to Hickam Hospital. Meanwhile, Monica Conter was downstairs on the main level trying to triage all the seemingly endless influx of critically wounded. She said, quote, all of these patients were coming in and we were putting them all out on the porch. There were those who were there were some who were killed and we were just putting them out in the backyard behind the hospital. They were just beginning to stack up. The small amount of medical staff was quickly overwhelmed by the massive influx of patients. The team refocused their efforts and converted into an evacuation hospital, transferring all critical cases to Tripler Hospital. Ambulatory patients were kept at Hickam and the rest were sent to the larger hospitals farther inland. Patients were quickly triaged, given morphine and tetanus injections, provided first aid care to stop the bleeding from wounds and sent to Tripler Hospital. Following the attack, physicians and nurses were not the only people in Hawaii that quickly mobilized and reported to the hospital to help. Within 20 minutes of the attack, the staff at the civilian defense headquarters began notifying and mobilizing first aid units and the emergency ambulance fleet. Being a Sunday morning, most volunteers were at home and could respond quickly. The first aid units dispersed throughout Oahu, treating over 2,000 people for injuries or illnesses that day, diverting thousands of people from the hospitals, allowing the nurses, doctors, and corpsmen to focus on the severe casualties without becoming overwhelmed by the large number of walking wounded. The emergency ambulance fleet was able to supplement that of the Army and Navy and transport critically ill patients to all four military hospitals in Oahu. This influx of resources likely saved many lives as drivers were able to provide first aid care on scene and the additional vehicles shortened the overall evacuation time for casualties. Many of these casualties arrived at Tripler Hospital, creating a chaotic scene on the front lawn of the hospital. The first casualties arrived at Tripler Hospital about 20 minutes after the attack began. Nurse Rosemary Corrigan described feeling shocked, horrified, and surprised when she arrived at Tripler. She said, quote, I remember one patient in particular had a terrific grape -sized, grapefruit-sized hole in his chest. 
he looked at me and said, why nurse, why? And I said, I don't know what the answer is. Both she and her patient had difficulty processing the scene that was unfolding before them. When Lieutenant Barron reported for duty at Tripler Emergency Room, it was already full of patients on litters needing care, the majority of which were transported from Hickam. The emergency room staff was quickly working through all the soldiers and sailors coming from Hickam Field and Pearl Harbor. Triage continued upon arrival at Tripler and patients were sorted based on who needed immediate surgery, those who could wait 24 to 48 hours for surgery, and those who did not need surgery but needed wound care. Patients that were dead or near death were sent to the Red Cross building behind the hospital, which was converted into a morgue. The emergency nurses continued to give patients injections of morphine and tetanus in a similar fashion as those at Hickam. They marked their foreheads with M or T to document who had received these medications. The primary mechanism of injury for soldiers injured on the Army bases was blast force and debris from the bomb, machine gunfire, or crush injuries from structural collapse. The majority of these injuries seen from an aerial bombardment consist of multiple fractures, hemorrhage, and extensively torn muscles, with many of those injured going into shock. The recommended treatment was to splint any fracture or torn muscle, provide warm blankets, sedate with morphine, and rest. Those that were triaged in the emergency room di directly to the wards were undressed, sorted, and assessed by the nurses. On many wards, the physicians were unable to examine the patients until that evening because they were busy stabilizing patients in and around the operating room, leaving the ward under the sole care of the nurses. In a three and a half hour period, 482 battle casualties came into Tripler Hospital. Casualties were transferred extremely quickly from the receiving office to the shock and preoperative wards at a rate of two patients per minute, overwhelming the staff at the hospital. Luckily, the nurses had help. The enlisted corpsmen were well-trained and performing many of the fundamental nursing duties such as undressing, cleaning, lifting, and feeding patients. The civilians of Oahu were also highly organized and ready to assist when the need arose. Trained and untrained volunteers, officers, wives, nurses, and even prostitutes reported to Tripler and other hospitals to volunteer their time. They quickly busied themselves making beds, feeding patients, making dressings, and sterilizing instruments. Those incurring more serious injuries involving the abdomen or chest would receive surgical treatment immediately with the goal of managing organ damage or internal bleeding. Fragment wounds also required immediate surgery. The operating rooms at Tripler were so busy that they often had two to three patients per room, many of which were being operated on while lying on the litter used to transport them into the hospital. Amputations, compound fractures, abdominal wounds, and chest wounds were common injuries requiring a high amount of surgical skill and post-operative nursing care. Remarkably, Dr. John Moorhead, a highly respected, experienced, and accomplished trauma surgeon, was in Honolulu teaching a large group of physicians about battlefield trauma. On December 3rd, 1941, four days before the bombing, Dr. John J. Moorhead arrived from New York as a guest of the Honolulu Medical Society to provide a series of lectures on traumatic surgery. Dr. Moorhead was one of the nation's most distinguished practitioners of traumatic surgery, a fellow in the College of Surgeons, and founder of the American Board of Surgery and a colonel in the Medical Reserve Corps. On Friday, December 5th, Dr. Moore had delivered a lecture entitled Treatments of Wounds, Civil and Military to an audience of approximately 300 physicians, many of which were Army and Navy medical officers. This lecture stressed early and adequate cleaning of wounds using soap and water, the use of sulfa in preventing infection, allowing wounds to remain open after surgery, and keeping surgical dressings intact for an extended length of time following surgery. On the morning of December 7th, Dr. Moorhead was giving a lecture to several prominent surgeons in Hawaii to learn about trauma surgery until a messenger interrupted his lecture to say that Pearl Harbor was under attack. Every physician in that room reported to Tripler Hospital. Although Tripler only had three operating theaters, operating teams shared space in the operating room and the uh, genitourinary ward and one of the delivery rooms as well was converted into additional operating space. <laughs> 
In total, nine surgical teams were moving patients through their operating rooms as quickly and efficiently as possible. As the dead and dying continued to stream into Tripler, the operating theaters became a revolving door for the 344 patients that would be admitted to the surgical service that day. Schofield, located in Northern Oahu, was also under attack from the Japanese. Although they had more resources than Hickam Hospital, they did not have as many staff, especially surgeons, as Tripler. Physicians were often busy in the operating room treating shock in the wards or treating and discharging minor injuries. At least one physician was in front of the hospital triaging casualties, but within the hospital, few physicians were available to sort casualties, leaving the task to the nurses. As the nurses had no training in the triage of casualties, the nurses did as much as they could to provide timely and adequate care to the wounded. Nurse Rhoda Zeisler was moved from her ward to the receiving area of the hospital to treat and sort the casualties. She explained her role in her journal. The injuries were very serious, dirty, bloody. More poor boys were dragged in. I can't describe the situations. We went from one bed to another, applying dressings, washing wounds. As soon as we got organized a bit, we started giving morphine one quarter grain. We triaged the boys. We were already, some were already marked from Wheeler that they had had morphine. We checked to see if they had tetanus shots. Her use of triage in her diary at the time demonstrates that although the nurses may not have been trained in triage, they're at least familiar with the term and the concept. Zeisler's role was later described as, quote, determining who needed surgery right away, who could wait, and who was not going to live. Physicians were also scarce on the ward, so the nurses went to work and did what had to be done. One of two nurse anesthetists at Schofield that day, Lieutenant Clark, could not manage all the preparation and intraoperative sedation alone. When Lieutenant Clark arrived safely at Schofield Hospital, several amb ambulances were unloading dozens of patients with at least 30 critical patients already waiting in the hallway outside the OR. Many of her patients had severe abdominal wounds and mangled arms and legs requiring amputation. She quickly started to prepare patients for surgery, working alongside many of the physicians who had volunteered to help. She quickly triaged and prioritized which patients needed surgery first, administered IV fluids and blood products to delay the onset of shock. Volunteer physicians helped with anesthesia by giving IV anesthetics, spinal blocks, and administering blood products. However, only those specially trained in anesthesia were able to give inhaled anesthetics. Nurses and physicians worked together as a team with some physicians prepping patients for surgeries while others operated. Nurses Bertha Gilmer and Pauline Gerard worked together on one of the surgical wards. Together, they split the ward in half as they and their corpsmen verified and admitted the new arrivals and segregated the pre- and post-operative patients. Nursing care of these patients prioritized controlling pain, preventing infection, and eventually rehabilitation. Nurse Myrtle Watson remembers using whiskey to treat pain and repurposed old vodka bottles to be hot water bottles when supplies were scarce. Schofield nurses also reported a high level of nursing autonomy. Nurse Alberta Nips explains the trust between the doctors and the nurses at Schofield. She said, quote, the doctors relied on us. They believed us. They listened to us. The nurses did all the dressings. We did all the treatments. The doctors expected us to. They relied on us because they couldn't be there all the time. The medical team at Schofield Hospital worked tire tirelessly for several days following the bombing to provide the best care possible for those injured or mortally wounded in the attack. Wound care at this time heavily emphasized protection from bacteria and bleeding control. Tetanus and other infections were also a major concern. However, inside the war zone, sterility was not always possible. All soldiers would have received a tetanus immunization prior to entering the combat zone and those with injuries from shrapnel, bullets, or other metals were given a booster vaccine. Oral sulfa, ther sulfa therapy was administered both pre- and post-operatively. Every soldier carried a packet of sulfa drug and was instructed to take it orally as soon as he was wounded. For wounds with heavy bleeding, nurses would apply a pressure dressing using a dry, sterile dressing or a freshly ironed handkerchief or towel. If a pressure dressing was inadequate to control the bleeding, a tourniquet was applied to either the upper arm or thigh with enough pressure to compress the artery against the bone. 
The tourniquet was loosened every 30 minutes and the wound reassessed for bleeding. If the bleeding decreased, direct pressure and pressure dressing were applied, which restored blood flow to and from the injured extremity. Wounds were not routinely irrigated due to the risk of rebleeding. Rather, they would sprinkle three to 10 grams of sulfadiazine into the wound, cover it with a dressing, and await surgery if needed. Other advances in wound care included packing and dressing wounds instead of immediately closing them with sutures. This allowed the sterile packing material to absorb infectious drainage from the wound and decrease the incidence of wound colonized with anaerobic bacteria, including the often fatal gas gangrene. There were only 15 total cases of gas gangrene in Pearl Harbor, all of which were from wounds that were prematurely closed with sutures. Overall, the surgical teams at Tripler and Schofield were highly successful in their treatment of casualties. The post-operative mortality rate at Pearl Harbor was 3.8% compared to a rate of 8.5% in World War I. This success is attributed to the prompt evacuation of casualties to the hospital, early shock treatment, the availability of plasma, thorough wound debridement, local and oral sulfa therapy, and secondary closure of wounds. Other factors unique to Hawaii, including the warm climate, intense sunlight, and lack of flies also contributed to the good surgical outcomes. Dr. Moorhead also speculated that as the attack occurred on Sunday morning, men were mostly clean, healthy, and well-rested prior to the attack. Finally, the post-operative care provided on wards by the nurses and corpsmen pr promoted the healing and recovery of the casualties. Now we're gonna switch gears and talk about the Navy nurses. So the USS Solace was one of two Navy hospital ships in the, US, in the US Naval Fleet in operation in 1941. The Solace was a fully equipped floating 432 bed hospital. The Solace was constructed with the latest medical technology available and was home to, home to her own bacteriological laboratory, pharmacy, physiotherapy department, plaster room, specialized wards and diet kitchens. Aboard the Solace was an able-bodied crew of 340 and medical staff of 11 medical officers, 128 corpsmen, and 13 nurses. The nurses served under the leadership of Chief Nurse Grace Lally, who was no stranger to wartime nursing and was one of the few nurses still serving who had served during World War I. Miss Lally, who was described as a, quote, handsome gray-haired Irish woman as ready with a quip as a smile, she held the Navy Nurse Corps record for sea duty and was well suited for leadership. The Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor shortly before 8 a.m. on a Sunday morning. Miss Ruth Cohen happened to be looking out towards the Arizona at 8:10 when she when a bomb hit and ignited 500 tons of gunpowder, creating a massive explosion. She described the site, quote, as though a million Roman candles had suddenly been set off on the gray battleship, which she knew was the Arizona, flaming pinwheels, unimaginable starry patterns of light. The Arizona quickly sank to the bottom of the harbor with over 1,000 men be trapped below deck. Without wasting another minute, the crew of the Solace began to prepare to receive casualties. Nurse Agnes Shore awoke to the call of command battle stations. She and the rest of the personnel aboard the Solace braced for incoming casualties as they tried to communicate through the deafening noise of the bombs and anti-aircraft fire surrounding them, praying they would not be targeted or accidentally hit with anti-aircraft fallout. The nurses and corpsmen quickly set up an additional 50 beds in the officer's lounge. Bandages, dressings, dried plasma, tannic acid solution, saline solution, and other medical supplies were opened and prepared for immediate use. Over 140 men were immediately discharged from the hospital ship, ship and bedbound patients were moved to the upper bunks to make more room on the lower bunks for casualties. The Solace soon began to receive casualties. Most men were filthy and covered in black oil and blood, making it difficult to quickly identify injuries or quantify the extent of the burned skin. A medical officer and nurse worked together to triage the patients on the ship's quarter deck. The physician would assess the patient's injuries while the nurse wrote the information on the casualty tag. Severely injured patients were given morphine from premixed syringes immediately upon arrival. 
From the quarter deck, the patients were sent to the various wards and a running census was maintained in the receiving room so no one ward would be overwhelmed and resources could be more evenly distributed. The collaboration between the doctors, nurses, and corpsmen in assessing, identifying, and assigning casualties while providing immediate treatment upon arrival was highly efficient and effective. Patients not rescued from the water or transported to the hospital ship were taken ashore to the Naval Hospital Pearl Harbor. The Naval Hospital Pearl Harbor was the primary medical facility for the Navy, which was quickly overloaded with casualties. Routinely, it had 12 wards, which accommodated 25 patients each, totaling 100, or 250 patients. With over 400 admissions in less than three hours, the hospital struggled to accommodate all of the casualties, half of which were burns. In total, 452 casualties were admitted to the 250 bed hospital that day, and 313 were taken to the morgue. That evening, 93 additional patients were transferred from the ship sick bays, nearby plantation hospitals, and first aid stations. By midnight, the hospital census had reached 961 patients. Due to the high number of critical cases, cases, the staff was unable to thoroughly clean and debride each burn using aseptic techniques. The appearance and extent of the burns was something the nurses had never before experienced. Nurse Phyllis, Dana, and Ann Tucker were assigned to a 40-bed burn unit. Dana recalled looking up and seeing a graying man standing beside the doorway and thinking, why is he gray? It turned out that he was naked and burnt gray and still walking into the hospital. As soon as patients were received in the wards, any remaining clothing was removed and shock treatment was Im immediately initiated. However, establishing intravenous access on a patient with severe burns proved difficult, and many, most patients required a physician to cut down through the skin to visualize and access a vein. Once intravenous access was established, plasma, if available, and supplemental saline and glucose solutions were given to combat shock. Patients in shock were kept flat or with their head lowered, given morphine, and kept warm. Over 70% of the casualties aboard the Solace and half of the Naval Hospital suffered from burns. Most burns were considered flash burns from being close to the explosion, which caused burns from a short exposure to high intensity heat. This caused mostly, mostly first and second degree burns and only exposed areas of skin were affected. Some burns were treated with dressings dipped in a mixture of mineral oil and sulfur medication, but the majority received tannic acid dressings. Burns were not Im immediately debrided except for the removal of fuel oil and sterile precautions were not practical. Given uh, keeping burns clean and dry was the main priority for the nurses. Large area burns were immediately sprayed with tannic acid or another tanning agent to quickly harden and desensitize the skin. Tannic acid so soaked dressings were immediately applied to other areas, including the face and hands and moistened every hour for the next 24 hours. Tannic acid dressings helped prevent fluid loss through the injured skin, and plasma was given to replace what fluid had been or would be lost. Essentially, this treatment would transform their soft, porous, sensitive, and burned skin into a hard, leathery shell, or eschar. After three to four days, the eschar would begin to separate from the healthy new skin below and could be carefully removed with Vaseline. Heat cradles were also an important nursing intervention. They were used to quickly dry out burns to prevent infection and fluid loss, keep patients warm, and facilitate healing. For those with burns on both the chest and back, patients would uh, lay on sterile sheets soaked in sterilized mineral oil and sulfadiazine to keep the sheets from sticking to the burned skin. The 29 Navy nurses stayed at the hospital and worked eight hours on, four hours off, around the clock for the next several days until volunteers arrived to supplement their staff and patients were stabilized or transferred. Another key factor in the success of the medical care at Pearl Harbor was the previous establishment of a blood bank in Hawaii, a relatively new technology that was not available in World War I. The bank had only 263 units of fresh plasma available on December 7th, which was depleted within the first hour. Following the attack, the blood bank processed 500 blood donors per day, every day until December 23rd, 
Less than one hour after a plea for blood donors on the radio, a line of hundreds of people had already formed outside the blood bank in Honolulu with volunteers waiting for hours to donate blood. Civilian defense workers, exhausted after a long day, stopped by the hospital to donate blood before sleeping and heading back to work the next day. Mothers waited in line with their small children. Among the civilian donors was the entire crew of a Dutch freighter, Jaeger Fountain, who disembarked to donate blood for their American allies before heading back out to sea. Following the attack on December 7th, over 4,000 pints of whole blood and 2,000 units of plasma were supplied to the Army and Navy by the blood bank. Nurses were able to administer plasma and whole blood to those suffering from the most severe injuries and burns. One of the reasons that I became interested in studying disasters was the way that disasters can bring out the best and sometimes the worst in humanity. These extreme life or death conditions truly test the human spirit, put into focus what is truly important, and can unite those who rarely agree on anything. In Pearl Harbor, officers' wives, Red Cross volunteers, civilian nurses and doctors, patients, and prostitutes came to volunteer to help the hospital and donate blood. At Tripler and Schofield, untrained volunteers assisted the effort by making dressings, cotton balls, and swabs out of the bolts of gauze at the hospital at all hours of the day and night. Patients and officers' wives also volunteers at Hickam to make dressings for soldiers, even arriving in the middle of the raid to help. Ambulatory patients volunteered to bring sterile solutions to the OR. Lieutenant Clark later reflected, everyone worked so well and functioned such as I have never seen. Truly a team. They knew what to do. They knew how to do it. Although the military response at Pearl Harbor was tremendous, the role of the civilians in their preparation, organization, resources, and support cannot be understated. The civilian population did more than meet their own needs. They were able to meet the needs of the military as well. Never before or since has such a collaboration been seen between the US military and the surrounding community. This unique relationship was essential to the success of the entire medical department of the Navy and Army during the, and following the attack on Pearl Harbor. The nurses, doctors, medical corpsmen, and volunteers worked together for many hours past their shifts to ensure all the patients were well cared for, despite being understaffed and having no breaks. Nurse Gerard reflected, no one had to ask you to stay on. You just stayed on until your work was done. In the service, if you're needed, you're there. We don't have to worry about overtime, that's your job. We can do 10, 12, 14 hours and think nothing of it because there was something to be done. Lieutenant Barron and two other nurses covered the Tripler emergency room for a 20 hour shift. Nurses who had worked the night before stayed on until the afternoon only to sleep and return less than eight hours later. The OR at Schofield took cases well into the night and started again the next morning. In many ways, the United States was unprepared and surprised by the attack on Pearl Harbor. However, the doctors and nurses working in Hawaii that day were able to swiftly care for the injured soldiers. The intersection of duty, resilience, and compassion shaped the nurses' work at all the Army and Navy facilities, and their story is a, te a testament to their dedication to others. The military nurses serving in Pearl Harbor played a significant role in the opening hours of the Japanese attack in 1941. Through triage, collaboration, stabilization, compassion, and dedication, they saved hundreds of lives. These themes are echoed throughout history, whether it's on the battlefield, in a trauma center following a mass shooting, caring for communities during a global pandemic, or living in one of several disaster-stricken or war-torn communities around the world. Nurses are always on the front lines of these events, caring for their communities and doing the best they can in the circumstances that they are forced to experience. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, and please just let me know if you have any questions. Thank you, Gwena. Erin. Hi, Gwyneth. Thank you very much for such a great presentation. I was really struck by something you said about how um, war and emergencies create this place where autonomy is required for nurses. And I'm wondering 
why do you think when nurses demonstrate their capacity during war that that autonomy is always lessened after military conflicts I wonder if you could speak about that I know it's a bit outside of your it's it's triggered a philosophical question in my mind <laughs> yeah um you know I think it just goes back to the whole idea of medical paternalism and nursing being subservient to physicians and I mean that's kind of been the model of of nursing since its professionalization and so um, I think that when physicians can exert control over nursing, they do. And when they realize that it's not worth it or they're too busy doing cooler, better, think whatever, operating, they don't have the resources. They're just like, you do whatever you can. Um, and so it's, it's interesting that, you know, like I said, one of the things I love about um, studying wars and disasters is you really see nurses work at their full scope. Um, whereas I think, regardless of whether or not that's what is expected of them on a daily basis, you can kind of see what they're able to accommodate during um, these crisis times. No, thank you. Um, I see a question in the chat. Where did you find the resource from research for this? Um, a lot of places. So this was my dissertation project. So I did a lot of research for a very long time. Um, a lot of my sources were oral histories that were collected by the Army or the Navy. Um, so a lot of the Army sources were from the Army Medical Museum, which is in um, San Antonio, Texas. I also accessed um, the BUMED, which is the Bureau of Medical, uh, our Navy, I don't know, Navy Medicine, basically there in um, College Park, I think, and then the National Archives also in College Park has a lot of the military medical history as well. Um, and then just like some newspaper articles, every December 7th, usually small communities will run stories about their, you know, Pearl Harbor survivors. And so I, I found some newspaper articles about, um, about it. And um, there's, you know, excerpts of nurses talking about Pearl Harbor and, and books and that kind of thing. So I just looked everywhere I could. Um, I think for my study, I had about 80 nurses represented of the about 200 total that were in Pearl Harbor. So um, I was able to find a lot of a lot of their voices. Um, have I been to Pearl Harbor? Um, I did go during my dissertation research um, in 2016, and um, I was kind of in my mid-20s at that point and really felt uh, uh, a bond, I guess, with the nurses that were there as someone that was there by myself, and I was just experiencing everything new, and going to the memorial and everything was, was really powerful, and actually getting to go on some of the military bases and you can still see some of the places where the bullets had hit the, the clinics um, was, was really powerful. So yes, I did get to go. Um, Susanna. Yeah, I was really struck by your comment about good surgical outcomes, um, partly because it was Sunday and the men had probably bathed recently, um, but also about the lack of flies and how that was helpful. And I'm wondering if you could comment a little bit more on the nurses' impressions of whether Hawaii was a, a healthy place for soldiers to be um, and other environmental impacts of the, I, I, I guess, of living and working there. Yeah, I, so the, the hospitals, I don't know if um, you remember some of the pictures, the hospitals were really really large and almost kind of like these big each ward kind of had its own building and they didn't have air conditioning so it was constantly just like free air kind of flowing through um so i mean if you go back to like florence nightingale nursing 101 you know fresh air sunlight good nutrition all of those things still apply and i think hawaii you have the constant breeze. So you're constantly recirculating air, which is good for preventing infection. You have, if they would actually take soldiers outside into the direct sunlight and that UV radiation would, would sterilize, you know, their, would help sterilize and clean their wounds. Um, and I think honestly, the, one of the best things was that the, um, the new, 
um, the, the Dr. Moorhead had just had that big, basically seminar for all of those physicians saying like, don't suture your wounds early, debride them, pack them, let them close naturally. It's all the wound care stuff that we do now. Um, but that was brand new technology at that point that they weren't doing in World War One. So I think that that, um, you know, having Dr. Moorhead there, being able to, to quickly mobilize the ORs, plus having the nurses having the, you know, the warm environment, the direct sunlight, um, you know, good nutrition, that kind of thing was all really important. That's great. Thanks so much. Um, I saw a question about were there nursing assistants at this time? So yes, they were called corpsmen. They were men that were enlisted and then given basic medical training and worked under the nurses. So they um, you know, we talk about there's not a lot of nurses, but there were a lot of corpsmen and then patients that were uh, already hospitalized that were maybe ambulatory, um, you know, they were there because they like sprained their elbow or dislocated their shoulder playing football before the attack, like they would help, um, they, they would help do nursing things like feeding patients and training patients and all of that. So nurses really did a lot of the more complex nursing care and supervised the corpsmen um, in the army. In the Navy, the um, nurses were actually responsible for a lot of the training of the corpsmen because um, the nurses would train, the Navy nurses would train the corpsmen who would would work on the hospital or on the ship's sick bays because, um, women were not allowed on the actual battleships. So the nurses had to train the corpsmen to basically assist the physicians independently and kind of be the nurse on the, um, on the ships. So there was a lot of training and collaboration between the nurses and the corpsmen um, and kind of, again, those kind of blurring of roles as well. Um, so question, was there any follow-up of these nurses related to mental health? A lot of the same conditions as COVID workers. Um, some of the nurses talked about having like some PTSD with what we would call it now. Like um, one talked about like hearing sirens and like, you know, kind of hitting the floor or loud noises and that kind of thing. Um, a lot of the nurses uh, would sleep in their clothes. They were afraid that they were gonna get um, taken as prisoners of war. Um, at the same time, the uh, Japanese were attacking the Philippines and a lot of those nurses were actually taken as prisoners of war eventually. So they, they assumed that the Japanese would invade Hawaii um, and they would be taken. And so a lot of them had contingency plans, like they would just walk into the ocean because they'd rather die than be taken prisoner. Some of them slept with golf clubs so they could like beat off whoever would come and attack them. And so, you know, having that kind of mental state and that mentality um, and that fear, but then also having to put on kind of a brave face to the, to your patients and comfort them, um, I think was, was difficult. Um, a book is coming, hopefully. <laughs> Um, another question about, yeah, shell shock. Um, so yeah, PTSD was, it wasn't really a thing yet. Um, they did recognize, I, I read, um, it was the Navy actually, like a medical report of people that would just like, for no reason, they would just die. Like they would survive and you'd get them hydrated and you treat their wounds and their burns. And then they would just like give up on life and they would die. So I think a lot of that is probably that, that mind body connection um, as well. I'm trying to read the chat here too. Um, Gwyneth? Yes. This is Jan Lee. Are you aware, were there any oral histories conducted with any of the nurses who were at Pearl Harbor or on Oahu? Yeah, so that was my primary data source for this study was oral histories. Um, it was, okay. Mm -hmm. I think there are probably about 30 from the Army, fewer from the Navy, but the Army did a big oral history project in the 80s when they had like a big reunion and interviewed a, a bunch of them. 
And it was great from a research perspective because they used the same interview guide. So they all basically asked them the same questions and it was the same interviewer. So I'm like trying to reconstruct this story when like seven people say that the nurses were doing triage. I think I can confidently claim, like say that the nurses were doing triage. So um, mm -hmm. that was really helpful. Uh, Dean Collins. Thank you. Um, you have a lot of expertise, Gwyneth, in disaster preparedness. I'm assuming that because these nurses, many of them were military nurses, that they probably also had some prepared, some training in disaster preparedness. But I'm wondering for our current nurses in nursing education, what kind of things should we be teaching them? I mean, because these nurses, they just acted on the fly and did a phenomenal job. Um, but what would you see um, being part of nursing education to just help a little bit that you have something to draw on um, if something should happen, something similar or even not quite similar, but just where you need to act quickly and fast. Yeah, I um, I agree. The actually the Pearl Harbor nurses didn't have any training. The um, kind of like nursing boot camp type military stuff happened after Pearl Harbor because they realized like oh these nurses are like in the line of fire. They need to know how to protect themselves and also like treat trauma. Um, it just kind of shows the disconnect between like nursing and and medicine that they the, the military medicine especially they assumed that the nurses would just know what to do, but you know, the nurses learning in these diploma training programs weren't learning about mass casualties and massive trauma and all of that. So um, it was a, a big learning curve for them, but they actually did implement training after Pearl Harbor for military nurses. Um, as far as nursing education, you know, I've been a part of some groups that have sort of talked about curriculum for um, disaster nursing and incorporating it in a little bit. Um, it's difficult with, you know, nursing programs are really driven by the NCLEX and by CCNE. And so unless they're really in those standards, it probably won't happen. But, um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, what I say is every nurse is a disaster nurse because a disaster can happen in any community at any time. And so you need to know how personal preparedness is the most important. So being able to prepare um, and have a plan for yourself and for your family so that you're not part of the problem so that you can help others is, is important. And then, um, you know, just knowing basic first aid, what you can, what you can and can't do outside of a hospital. Um, and then I know a lot of, um, a lot of at least hospital relief is um, coming in to relieve workers and that kind of thing um, after the time. So, um, you know, hospital disaster plans usually don't include a lot of at least frontline nurses, maybe administrators, but not frontline nurses. So I think getting nurses involved in their own community disaster planning in their hospital is really important too. If I can comment on that, Gwyneth. Sure. Um, this is Jan Lee again. Um, the When the Northridge earthquake hit in California back in 1993 or four, I forget which, um, I was doing some work out of UCLA affiliated with the uh, Sepulveda VA, which was the only hospital closed, evacuated, and had to be, it was never rebuilt because it was too damaged too close to the epicenter. Those nurses had been in, in that hospital, had been undergoing disaster training from a clinical nurse specialist for a period of about two and a half months for just general preparedness being a VA medical center. And they performed those who were on duty in the middle of the night, the earthquake happened about four something AM California time, performed wonderfully because they had had this, um, had just been going through this extensive training in terms of evacuating patients and triaging and so on. The other comment I would make about nursing education is that many community health courses now incorporate basic disaster uh, training, which can be accessed uh, through the Red Cross, it's online. There are any number of governmental modules that are available to the public for more advanced training. And I was seeing before I retired from nursing at a lot more uh, voluntary use of those in community health nursing. Mm 
And okay. those are resources available to anyone. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's a couple of questions over here in the chat. How did nurses manage if they had families, husband and children? So um, nurses were not allowed to serve in the military unless they were uh, unmarried and were not did not have their children with them. So um, that was not an issue because they were literally just there by themselves with the other nurses. And then um, a comment about the fact that there is no African-American nurses or volunteers in any of the photos and that they did exist. Yes. Um, so at this point, the um, they were not accepting Black women into the Army or the Navy Nurse Corps um, prior to Pearl Harbor. Later in the war, they did um, because they had to recruit a lot more nurses and they recognized that Black nurses um, were um, were trained and available and they were also so they would um, recruited Black nurses to care for Black um, like regiments and divisions of soldiers in World War II. Um, but at this time in Pearl Harbor, you're right, there were no African-American nurses. I do believe there were, there were some African-American men serving in the on naval ships um, and potentially in the army, but um, no nurses at that time. Gwenna? Um, hold on, I'm gonna get Anne-Marie McAllister first because she's okay. had her <laughs> So thanks, Gwyneth. Great talk. I appreciate that. I just wanted to add a little context to the question about how did they handle their, their husbands and their families, but this was well before um, nurses could have families. Um, when you went to nursing school in that area, you went to a diploma program, a hospital-based program, and you were required to live there. You, you know, you couldn't, if you were married and had a family, that would would uh, negate that. It wasn't until 1952 when the, uh, with the advent of community colleges that allowed um, nurses uh, of color, men, and um, what old nurses. And by that, I mean, you know, 23 or 24, when in that day, people got married. And once they started their families, they retired from nursing. It wasn't the era of daycare or anything like that. Uh, women just stayed home with their children. And so, you know, that sort of adds to the context of, of what was going on. These were all single, young single women, um, you know, white women. Um, and I just thought I would, it wasn't until 52 with the first community college programs that opened up the world to uh, diversity and, and um, <laughs> older nurses. Uh, uh, Kathy, go ahead. I, I have two comments. One is related to the preparation of nurses, and I think both uh, it, for, for disaster, I think both Katrina and 9-11 kind of um, changed the world in many ways. And as a result of that, at least in public health, the emphasis on disaster preparedness um, was tremendous. And um, incredible amounts of resources were sent uh, out, dollar resources were sent to com communities and health departments at state and local levels to begin to really organize and formalize that disaster preparedness. How much that reaches down to frontline nurses in um, public health and, or in even less maybe so in hospital acute care settings, um, I'm not sure I could, could speak to, but at least at the uh, planning level, much more has taken place for, for disaster preparedness. And then the second comment is about um, um, nurses and their families. Uh, they may not have been married. They had, they had families. They were daughters of someone or sisters of someone. So I'm sure that uh, there was lots of attempts to communicate back and forth, are you safe, are you well, things like that. Um, but the lack of or recognition of um, marriage as being something that women could do along with a career persisted pretty long. I happened to be the first nursing student in my baccalaureate program in 1969 who got married. If you were married, you had to leave the school. And that was a baccalaureate program. Um, so it persisted for a long time. Thank My you. poor husband had to interview with the 
with the head of the nursing, our nursing school of all things. It was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think um, we're out of time, but I know, Carol, you've had your hand up, so we'll give you the last word. Okay, I, I have a couple of comments related to those who have already said something. Um, in my time of teaching at UIC in the College of Nursing between 19... Eight, I can't even remember now between my ages of 65 and 75, I did bring in information to the undergraduate nurses in my community health classes about disaster work. We talked about pandemics and how nurses might function during those times. We just kind of interwove it. There was never any talk about exactly what nurses would do in a disaster. The second thing I would like to mention uh, is that even before I retired, I received training by the village of Oak Park to become a, a community disaster responder. And I have done that for many years now. Uh, <clears throat> and we are just trained to be people in our neighborhoods who help people stay safe in case of a disaster. Uh, we teach people what kind of supplies they need to keep in their homes so that they can manage for at least three days. We, uh, I, our group was asked to give volunteer time to give a vaccine starting in January of 2021, and I did that also. So there are many ways that one can still participate in disaster help. Okay. Well, I, um, unfortunately, I know people have to get off for other meetings and I have a meeting too. So um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, and uh, this is recorded. So I will send out an email to um, everyone that registered um, when the recording is available with the link um, for those that registered that couldn't attend. So thank you so much for all of your comments. Um, I did put my email in the chat if you have any other questions or comments for me about the presentation it's Gwyneth g-w-y-n-e-t-h at uic.edu so thank you all have a great day and happy st patrick's day for those that celebrate <laughs> <laughs>